everyone. Welcome to the Yasmin Muhammad podcast. Our guest today is Siavash. Siavash is from Iran, but he is currently living in Canada as a refugee, actually, because he is considered by the IRGC to be one of the enemies of the Islamic Republic. Siavash, welcome. Thank you for having me. Looking so forward to our talk. Yeah, yeah, we've got lots to talk about. Um, I want to start off with, you know, I've had a lot of Iranian women on this podcast before, but you're the first Iranian man. And most of the world became uh, familiar with the plight of Iranian women because of the Women Life Freedom Movement, which was, of course, instigated by the killing of Masa Amini. And um, this is the first time that I'm hearing like the male perspective. So, of course, you know, men are not quite as restricted by the regime as women, but of course, it's still a violent theocracy for everyone and everyone still suffers under it. So I'd like to hear your experience growing up under the regime um, personally, like as an individual, and then also just in general for, for men there, what it's like. So... <clears throat> As you mentioned, it's a totalitarian theocracy. So it's not about necessarily who for the regime to basically go against it, uh, go after. It's about whoever doesn't exactly follow the regime. It's not like a certain type. It's not a certain ethnicity or gender, really. Now, the Islamic law, law which is the foundation of the Constitution of Islamic Republic, the Sharia law, forbids women from certain things. And uh, if you're familiar with Sharia law, you know like women's uh, diye, basically the retribution money for murder is half the men. Uh, their testimony is considered half the men, like two women for a man. And they're not allowed to be judges. They're not allowed to be president and such and such. But women who support the regime who go with the ideology can get to higher powers and upper level echelons just not the top two maybe seats and uh, hijab is for the regime is really not like a ideological thing it's mostly a symbol of power because every totalitarian regime needs the people to fear it and for the people to fear it, it needs to have an excuse to be involved in their daily life. Mm -hmm. They should see the symbols of regime's power in their everyday life. Otherwise, they will not fear it as much. So for them, the best excuse was hijab. Because Iranian women were not used to hijab. And uh, by creating the committees and then the uh, morality police, Gasht Ershad, they are now they now have an excuse to be present every day the symbols of fear every day in the streets bothering people and uh, it is true that women get the like in that aspect women are getting the worst of it but i kind of don't go with that term way of putting things because it's kind of an inter intersectional thing and in Iran, we don't really have that. It's like if we want to create, like like here, if we want to create a hierarchy of victimhood, women are not at the top. It's the Baha'is. Baha'ism is a re Iranian religion, mm -hmm. which came like the Protestant Islam, basically. It was from modern times. It came like 200 years ago. They became popular, so the clerics and the dynasty at the time Gajar dynasty went after them massacred them so their prophet escaped went to Ottoman Empire which is and the area that is now Israel so his grave is there the international Baha'i community uh, leadership is there and if you're a Baha'i in Iran by the fact that you're a Baha'i you're a criminal like you are like you can't do anything about it. Like you can't be a pro-regime Baha'i. You just can't. You're a Baha'i, you're a criminal. So they're not allowed higher education, even though like women are the majority of our higher education in Iran right now. 
But Baha'is are not allowed higher education. They're not allowed public sector jobs. They're not allowed government jobs. Uh, their properties are easily taken away from, just taken away from them. And even when they try to form, for example, a private university, they invite some professors and try to educate their children because they're denied education. The government attacks these, raids, raids them and arrests all the professors. There are now like dozens of Baha'i professors in prison for teaching like math, and sciences <laughs> like it has no and baha'is are forbidden by their religion to get involved in, with politics but all of them are labeled as israeli spies because their center is in israel and uh, the it's called uh, the crime is membership in the um fake cult of Baha'ism, basically. That would be kind of the translation. That's a crime. Mm -hmm. So because of that, and then like there is Sunnis in Sistan and Baluchistan, which are just massacred by the regime, like horrifying conditions of living and no water, nothing. It's just horrifying. So we kind of in Iran, protesters very early on rejected the whole uh, intersectional narrative. And it was like, no, we're all in this together. It's not about a certain group or thing, because when you make it like a gendered revolution or an ethnic revolution, you exclude everybody else. And in a revolution, the one thing you can't do is exclude other people who are victims. You need a mass. You need people to become a mass. So, yeah, that's basically the. So I. I, yeah. Tell me about your experience. Okay. I haven't heard about your experience yeah. as a Shia straight male well, living I, I, in I, Iran. I was born into a like an atheist family. Mm -hmm. So and my, my dad was political. So we were early on, very early on. He explained what's going on. We started reading newspapers like at when I was like eight. I started developing like nervous tics at nine. <laughs> and uh, uh, stomach issues, like nervous issues, like uh, he put a lot of on us very early on and uh, everything in Iran. Basically, when you're a kid and you it's time to go into society at like seven, six to school. The first thing your parents do is teach you how to lie. That's oh. literally the first thing they do, because you can't say to anybody what's going on in our house that we drink alcohol, for example, that we hate the regime, that we do this, that we do that. So you learn to have a persona in public. There's a famous like a thing that we say, yeah, when we're talking, we were talking about a movie when we were kids. It was always like, yeah, we have a neighbor who has a video because VCR was illegal in Iran mm -hmm. for the first 10 years. So you say, we have a neighbor who has VCR and we saw it there. <laughs> <What's> the mm -hmm. <laughs> so you learn how to lie from childhood. Schools, there's a lot of ideological programming. Every day morning when you're going, you line up in queues and you have to chant death to America, death to Israel, death to whoever's not favorite that day. And uh, praises to the leader. There is Quran, there is prayer. And then you go to in school, religious education, Quran, and uh, then there is for a prayer, mandatory prayer in schools. I was not from a religious family, so I didn't know how to say prayer. So I was faking it until I was like 15. And, uh, and it was fun faking it. And I even became like the imam a few times, like I would go in the front. <laughs> because you want the teachers to like you. So I remember I would just... you telling this story on Twitter, and then you said you did like twenty five rakas or something. Oh <laughs> you didn't yeah, know when to I, end I did it. six. I did six <laughs> rakas, and I was going for the seventh. I was getting up for the seventh, <laughs> and the guy standing there said, "Hey, hey, hey enough, enough." Which prayer was this? Was this the afternoon uh, the prayer? Noon, yeah. Well, noon yeah, prayer. So four. Four. It's supposed to be four. I was yeah. going for seven. I was breaking the record, <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, so there was all that, but 
it's really weird because you can't really say anything and your teachers are pushing this ideology on you because they're yeah. forced to they can't say and they might not even believe it but if they say mm -hmm. anything somebody's going to report it and they're going to lose their job at mm -hmm. at least they're going to lose mm -hmm. their job so it's just lies from every mm -hmm. place until you find your people and then you can trust them and uh, yeah yeah and then girls are out of the question early on like literally until because it's it's an issue like i was uh okay i'll get to that but uh schools are all separate and uh boys used to get uh the morality police used to come after boys too and it still does like if you were wearing a short sleeve if you were wearing jeans like uh, tight jeans or whatever like there was morality police for that too even though the stores were selling those clothes like a guy would just come and just get a razor and tear your whole jean from bottom to top. As you're they wearing would, it. Yeah. And uh, I I have memories of just running away from these people in the street. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, uh, but it becomes like a fact of life. You have to adapt and just accept it that this is how it is because we didn't know any better. So it's, this is how life is. We just don't like it. And uh, we fight it. Like I was 19 uh, when I was arrested and uh, with a girl. Well, in my story on Twitter, I really shortened it because the real story is more embarrassing because it wasn't even my girlfriend. It was like my friend. I went there with my friend. His girlfriend was coming and his girlfriend's friends were coming and sister. My friend and his girlfriend went to call, went to make a phone call or whatever to get their families come. So me and these two girls were standing by the sea. I don't know them, nothing. Some, a car passes by and starts catcalling them a couple of times. So the third time I went there, I was like, hey man, fuck off. And uh, the guy left. Five minutes later, a police car came and was like, uh, what are you doing here? And I was like, we're just waiting for our families to come. And he was like, are you related? And at the time, the thing is you say, yeah, we're cousins. Mm -hmm. The police, that's what you say. And I said, yeah, we're cousins. And he was like, get in the car. I was like, no, my family is coming. And he was like, get in the car, I'll kick you in the car. So we got in the car, they took us to the police station. We spent the night in uh, jail. I was in a separate one. The two girls were in another one. The well, next what day, were you being, what were you being imprisoned for? What was the it's crime? Called, it's called illegitimate relations, and because it can you're be standing next to each other in public. Yeah, because we were reported. If we weren't reported, it might not have been a thing. But somebody report that guy who passes by. And when they took us to the police station, that car was actually on the other side mm. of the street. The guy was out there and he did this. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, he had connections and he used it to mess with people. And uh, the next day they took us to court. And my dad came at the time and my friends for support. And uh, like the mentality wasn't like, Oh, look at this horrifying thing that's happened. Like my friends were telling me stories about their lashings. Mm. And they were like, yeah, if they use like belts, you, it's 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 going to be great if they use belt. Belt is nothing. Like if they have the leather thing, that's like worth. And like we're just. <laughs> and my dad asked a officer there. He was like, what type of judge is it? And the officer said, it's a good judge. Mm. Wow. So for legal reasons. Not my dad, me, went in, talked to the judge and paid him a little bit. We were poor, so we didn't have enough money. So he cut our lashes from like 70 to 50. And uh, yeah, we went to the place, the enforce sentence enforcement department. And But the funny thing was, that was it, an interesting thing, was that head of that department because there was a lady in charge of the girls that day. And that lady had to take them to the 
uh, court and everything. And that lady apparently had an appointment that day that she missed because of the girls. So she was really pissed off and annoyed. And uh, when we got to the sentence enforcement thing, the lady told the boss there that I need to lash these girls myself. They made me lose my apartment. And, and that the officer there was like, uh, no, you're angry. So it's better that you don't do it. We don't do this because we like it. It's our job. So what happened was the girls had a, one of the girls had a very thick jacket. They lashed her over that jacket. So basically, she didn't feel anything. And then they gave that jacket to the other one and they lashed her over that jacket. That was very mm. interesting. That guy was not an evil guy. He was just product of that environment. Me, yeah, they stripped me and just went to town. But so, yeah, I was 19. And uh, when that happens to you at 19, <laughs> it's like... Yeah, it, it affects your relationship with women after that for a while, at least. It leaves a black eye to the rest of the <laughs> events. Yeah. But I learned how to look at it as ridiculous later on. When I was in Turkey, I learned how to look at the whole, all of these experiences as just ludicrous. Like a ridiculous adventure. Because... I was like, if I don't, I'm going to go crazy. And I was, mm -hmm. I, I'm a sensitive person. I can't sit in all that emotion and feelings and feel them every mm -hmm. day. So I just decided it was a conscious decision to look at it as a very ridiculous experience, life experience. It's like people who tell you about their drunk experience. One night they went and did that thing. I decided to look at them at as that so i could mm. basically escape this straight jacket mm. but uh yeah so that's so yeah that's that's life that's a very normal thing guys getting lashed it's a normal thing um so how did you 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 ended up obviously had a lot of anger towards the regime because they were the ones that did this to you over nothing yeah. um so walk me through how you went from being 19 years old just getting out of prison obviously healing physically as well as mentally or trying to heal and then how did you get to the point where you were named a uh one of the Islamic 30 traders enemy? The Islamic yeah. yeah it was uh i went to work then i uh i went to university I quit. It was accounting. I was going to kill myself. So I left. And uh, it was just stupid. Accounting is for certain people. But uh, then I went to work. I was a good translator. I always loved English since childhood because it was like a window to another place that wasn't yeah. there. And uh, so I went back to university to get a degree in English because all the jobs that I was being offered when they realized I didn't have a degree, they wouldn't basically pass on me. So I went to university to get my degree. And that's where I basically got met this few friends who were kind of very smart, well-read people. And I hadn't met people like that in my circle because we were from a poor family. My parents were educated mm -hmm. that was it like they had studied in France and everything. And, uh, but they were poor. But under the Shah, you could do that. Like poor, if you worked hard, you could make enough money and go to France and study. My dad was an orphan, right. but he just from labor, he was able to do that. And uh, so they raised us kind of different from the environment we were in. So when I went to university and I saw these people, oh, they read stuff. They have the same interests. They have the same views. So we became friends. We started, it was during Ahmadinejad. So the universe, all the university associations were shut down. All the student activists were arrested and everything. So we decided to reopen the student association. And that's where all of it started. We went head to head with the university a few times. We saw, gathered petitions and everything. And uh, 
It was 2009 with the green movement thing that happened, which we were not necessarily a part of because we believed it was a reformist movement and we were anti-regime. We believed reformists are just another version. Mm -hmm. But we supported it, supported the movement. And one of, uh, we were like the five of us were these different secretaries of this association. One of our secretaries was kidnapped by the intelligence the day after, uh, two days after the election when the protests started. He was kidnapped. And uh, the next day we organized a protest in university. It was during the final exams. We organized the protest after the exams and uh, we asked the university dean, who's also a member of the province's security council to tell us where his student is, where he, where they took him. And uh, the next day we organized another gathering. It was way bigger. 4,000 students showed up. It was a university of like 12,000 students. So it was big and a big rally. And uh, the final exams were canceled. And uh, two hours into it, we saw just different cars uh, like police, army, IRGC, vans oh with thugs just coming around surrounding the university. Universities are their separate um, entities. They have their own security. So yeah. the officials, basically the police and stuff, don't come in. They let the university handle it because the head of the university, the IR, the intelligence ministry has a direct office in the university. So it's mm -hmm. a separate entity. And universities also have their own Basij IRGC uh, student wow. body in the university who's in charge of basically suppression and everything. So we were surrounded and uh, the girls dorm was in front of our university. So we asked them at around like eight. They said, when it gets dark, we're going to come in. We were negotiating with them. We're going to come into university and arrest all of you. So, and get the basically sick these thugs on you. And so we negotiated to let them at least get, let the girls go into their dorm because it was right in front of the university. We were like, at least less people are going to get arrested immediately. They accepted, they moved back. We this girls went into the dorm and then we surrendered. They said they're gonna take us to the dorm. They took us to the police station. Mm. Over like at the time, like 300, 400 students were left still because we were people were escaping before they completely mm -hmm. shut it down. So in the police station, they took everybody out. They started uh, getting their names. And there was a representative of uh, intelligence ministry and the student Basij, student IRGC, there. Basically, uh, exchanging notes, like who should be who should be arrested and everything. And uh, out of those few hundred, they named 30 who were more, ra more rowdy. Then uh, they released those the rest of the students out of those 30. They, now we're handcuffed in the yard and they're just walking around, kicking us, beating us. And there's this chief of police who's saying the weirdest shit to one of our kids who the kid was a wrestler. It was a tough looking kid. And this police chief is saying the most sexually weird thing. Like I'm going to shove like hard boiled eggs up your butt and like you want me to get like weirdest shit like it's like when you have power and you don't know what to do with it crazy yeah it's that kind of shit it's like i have absolute power over these people and i don't know what to do so i'm just gonna say shit <laughs> it's like it's nuts and after like a few hours they got basically they asked they read 10 names us out of those 30 they forced those 20 to sign a pledge and left them and uh, released them and out of us there was like actually there was like six of us two of us two other ones were kurdish activists and were very involved that day and the other two were just 
there. Like one of them was Sunni and a Kurd. And the guy literally like nine of us went in the van. The van took 10. And he was the last one. And the guy asked, what's your name? He said, uh, Semko Babakri. And he said, uh, are you a Sunni? He said, yes. Are you a Kurd? He said, yes. He said, get in. And the kid was a nerd. He was not involved in anything. He was just got caught in the university. He was in the library. He couldn't get out. Mm. And he was a math nerd. But he looked kind of big and he was a <laughs> so we He's used the to wrong joke, ethnicity and the wrong religion. Yeah, we used to joke that he was the diversity arrest because most mm. of us were <laughs> technically Shiites and he mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh then they took us to police station. We spent the night there. The next morning, we were interrogated by the like robbery homicide investigator and an intelligence ministry investigator. And this guy is just lining us up and just hitting us with batons. And we are like in handcuffs and shackles. And it's like really weird. Like we're nerds and we're handcuffed and shackled. Like I didn't even know shackle was a thing. Until I got arrested. And uh, this guy's beating us again, doing really weird shit. Like he pulled the like the underpants off of one of our kids, just tore it off. And it's like he was obviously a war veteran and had like PTSD stuff. So he was not normal. But he was put in charge of interrogation because he was crazy. Mm-hmm. Then they sent us to court and the judge said, look, I used to be in the student. He sent the representative of the prosecutor out and uh, he said, I used to be in the student in uh, like 1998. They attacked our dorm, the IRGC. So I get what you're in, Mm -hmm. what trouble you're in. Can't help you, really? All I can do is go by the absolute word of the law, not what they request. Mm -hmm. So he sent us to prison. We were supposed to go to prison for two days until they come up with a verdict. It took about a month. We were, yeah, we were in prison in uh, Babol's Matikola prison. And uh, the, it was a newly built prison it had a political ward specifically for political prisoners with its own small yard and uh, we were there we got interrogated on several occasions by intelligence ministry agents and uh, after like two weeks because we really didn't give them anything useful one day the the door just opened and these three giant really giant dudes walk in obviously prisoners and uh, they came we were in the yard smoking they came in the yard sat on the other side and we're looking at now again we're all nerds except for one of us who was a wrestler and we had talked in advance that if they take us to the general population he's gonna be our tough guy (laughs) we had talked about all of these and uh so these three guys come to there. The guy takes off his shirt. There's like all sorts of just knife marks on his body. And he's obviously like a big thug, like a leader. And the other two are his like henchmen. So this, uh, we don't know what, we know what, what the deal is, but we don't know what to do. So this wrestler friend of ours, he went in and started talking to the guy. And it was like, hey, man, you're really well. Do you work out? Do you do? Do you wrestle? You look like you're built because the guy's ears were broken. So he was like, are you a wrestler? And, whatever. and the guy said, yeah. And our wrestler friend said, yeah, I'm a wrestler, too. I go to this club. Do you know that guy? He's my friend. And the guy said, yeah, that's my cousin. And he was like, oh, yeah, he's my friend. And, it was, and we were all like, oh. <laughs> Because he told us, he said they sent us in to basically rape you. Oh, my God. And beat the shit out of you. So you say whatever they want. But you guys are good kids. And he was on death row. So they couldn't really do much to him. 
And uh, this basically, this wrestler friend of ours saved our butts, literally. Wow. And wow. yeah, it wasn't all bad. We learned. Oh, you muted yourself there. Did you like, just say it wasn't all bad about your prison experience? Sorry, I'm getting a call for something. Oh. But uh, yeah, it it's I'm joking. It was a very traumatic time. I got yeah. uh, one night. Uh, it was in the summer in north of Iran. It's very humid. So we would take off our shirts and pants and just sleep in our underwear. Uh, when they would turn off the light. So one night, this guy, this new guy keeps coming in after lights out. Like 10 minutes after lights out, he comes in. And he's like, why are you not wearing your pants and shirts? And we were like, it's warm. He says, hey, wear it. So we wore him. He got out. We took him off. 10 minutes later, he comes in again. It was just, it's fun. It's, it's, they entertained themselves. It's a power and came play, in, I guess. Yeah. We wear him. We wore him. Went out. Third time he came in, we were here. The, we heard the door. Everybody dressed up, and I didn't. I was pissed off. So he comes in and he's like, "Why are you in your underwear?" And I was like, "Because it's warm. It's humid." And he was like, "Don't you see me wearing all this? It's warm for me too." And I was like, "Yeah, but you get a salary." I don't want to be sheer. <laughs> I literally said that and mm -hmm. that pissed him off. He said, come on, come out here. And I was like, I'm not gonna. He said, I said, come out. And he couldn't really drag me. So he went out, he took a soldier, came in, handcuffed me to the back. They took me out. As we got to the hall, he kicked under my leg. I went head first. Then he put his knee on my back and my hand is cuffed. So I can't really protect my face. So my nose broke a little bit again there. And he grabs my hair and he says, where are you from? Now, it's uh, in the north. There are small towns near each other. And I'm originally from Tehran. We moved to the north. And in the north, they're not big fans of people from Tehran. So in my ADHD head, I'm calculating what to say to this guy because I also lived in two different cities in North. So I'm like, if I say this city, this guy might be from that city and might hit me harder. If I say from Tehran, he might really hit me. So I'm <laughs> in this weird situation. I'm just calculating these things. And at the end, I couldn't say anything. I just said around here. That's literally what came out of my mouth. And he was like, you're sassing me? And he just banging my mm. head against the floor. And he's like, you're sassing me? And um, he keeps beating me. And the guy, uh, the night shift guy and uh, the officer was just w standing there, just smiling, just laughing. And after he beat me, good amount, the guy said, hey, this these are intelligence ministry prisoners. You can't leave a mark on them because then mm. they can say the intelligence ministry beat them. Intelligence ministry doesn't want that. Mm -hmm. That's an ex that's that's a cost for them. They don't want that. So this guy really got scared. So he took me back and then he was kind of trying to suck up to us so we wouldn't report it to the intelligence ministry guys. And uh, yeah, they allowed us unlimited yard time. But yeah, but I went in and uh, I, and my friends were starting to shout and really make noise in the prison when he was beating me there. So I went in. Uh, everyone was like, "What happened? What happened?" And I was just, I just walked. I went into the showers and I just closed the door and I just turned on this thing and I just started bawling. <laughs> it was like it's really like I laugh because I don't want to feel it yeah. again I felt I it enough I don't want to feel it uh, and that's the best defense mechanism I could have found but mm. uh, it's like complete and utter hopelessness mm -hmm. there is nobody not in this town not in this province not in this er 
in this country, there is nobody who's on your side and might help you. You can't complain and hope for help from anybody. The whole system is against you. It's very blatant. So, yeah, afterwards, uh, we were basically released on bail in a month. A few months later, our uh, sentence came. It was uh, prison and lashing. Then uh, we appealed. A year later, our appeal came. It was the same thing. So me and a couple of my friends from university, we talked and we were like, uh, yeah, I don't think. Because they told us, they told us, forget about higher education. You're not going to get there. Like, basically, that's one of the things they do. Any student who does something gets a flag and they are just completely done with higher education. So we talked and we were like, yeah, we should leave. And I had just gotten married at the time and it was a whole thing. So, oh. yeah. So that's I, how you ended up coming to Canada. I went to Turkey for two and a half years. Yeah, I, as a refugee. Then I came to Canada after, yeah, two and a half years of mm. wedding and everything. Yeah. Wow. Sorry, I went too long. Yeah. No, no, that's all right. I just, um, I have so many questions for you. We don't have a lot no of time. Problem. So that's... Uh, but I am very interested in, obviously, in, in hearing everything that you are are telling us. It's it's important to hear it from a first person perspective because we're constantly hearing about just the numbers of people that are arrested in Iran, the numbers of people that are getting lashes in Iran, the numbers of people that are being beaten in prison in Iran, and it it almost like. I don't want to say it de you're desensitized, but it's like you just you hear it so often. Yeah, it is desensitizing. Like it's yeah. it's exhausting, but yeah. you it but you don't spend the time. You can't spend the time because it's too it's too dark. Yeah. Um, you know, to to think about this at the situation for every single one of these individuals and how their experience under this, you know, the these these animals these in the in the prison system you're being too these kind people are going to be affected for the rest of their lives you know yep. if they do yep. survive you know the, yep. i was reading a, a bbc article about how the those prisoners rape the girls so that they don't end up be virgin so that they don't end up going to heaven you know that was yeah like the you, first can't, you can't even read years, it you yeah. can't yeah, yeah, you can't you can't even um, no, they 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 engage. marry the girls to one of the soldiers there. They used to, and uh, then uh, so she wouldn't go to heaven because she would be a, she wouldn't be a virgin, and then they would f charge the family for the bullets. Yeah, I remember yep. hearing that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it is um, it is horrifying, and uh, this is why you see this shift that it's like we're done with that whole like 2017 was the first mass uprising it was in about 30 cities and the weird thing was even small towns like small towns of like 30 40 000 people and uh the first chant in 2017 that came out was reformists fundamentalists your game is over because right. that was yeah. the game the regime had sold the west for 30 years mm -hmm. and the people oh yeah. if the reformists come to power this is going to be the... and that was yeah. the first chant the second chant was no to gaza no to lebanon my life for iran that was the yeah. second but not because people hate it Gazans are Lebanese, because all but your because money is going there. Yeah. That's the it's not just the it's the regime's ideology. Right. That's literally their ideology to be involved in those things so they can use them. Yeah. To their advantage and justify a lot of their shortcomings. And so, uh, yeah. There when you say it is the um that's the agenda of the regime. So they are basically trying to create a Shia caliphate. They're just trying to counter 
you know, basically you've got ISIS and Hamas and, you know, so they want to, they want to yeah. counter those Hamas guys with not, their own. Yeah, but it is useful to them. Yes. But yeah. That's right. But they've also designed, basically created uh, Qatar al Haq and uh, the Islamic Jihad there, mm -hmm. who are theirs. Yeah. But uh, that's Khamenei's actual thesis was the Ummul Ghura, Shiite Ummul Ghura, basically like right. a Soviet Union of Shiites, basically. Yeah. With, well, it's still the, his. Yeah. Yeah, with these um, satellite I states. We've got some hands going up, so I know people want to continue talking about this, but I want to talk to you about your experience in Canada. So I'm just going to open it up oh, to boy. the group. We'll continue talking about um, Iran for a little bit, but I do want to get to um, your can experience we go in Canada as a refugee. We, we we can go a bit longer. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, okay. But, I, but I'm just like notifying you because... Um, I know that you really do want to talk about the, the regime in more detail, and that is really important. But I yes, want to yes. understand what I really want to get to is from somebody from your experience, what is your message to the West? Now that you have lived in Iran, you have lived in Canada, what pers you have a perspective that not many people can have. And I want you to share with us your um, your perspective. So okay. let's get to the questions now. Um, Toshi, go ahead. Hey, what's up, Yasmin and uh, Sivash? I hope I'm getting your name right. How you doing, bro? Um, so actually, it's it's great that you're saying that because that my question was actually leaning very much towards your Canadian um, experience. What I wanted to know was, in your experience, you know, given what you experienced in Iran and sort of the um, the leadership, what I guess what I'm trying to figure out is Iranians that live in Canada um, or in the West, like how do they look at this stuff, really? You know, where are they? Um, and, and culturally, in terms of um, do they um, do they look at it as wrong and they want to fix it? Are they more um, like reformed Muslims, or are they still holding on to some that sort of authority? You know, like the marks of authoritarian. Yeah. That's thinking? a very yeah, good question. Yeah. 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 Should I get into it now or are there other go questions? What no, do we do? Ahead. Okay. So Iranians abroad uh, were a few waves of diaspora, basically. The first wave was all the, most of the intellectuals right at the revolution. Most of the uh, innovators, uh, industry people who brought like great industries into Iran. And uh, the basically the smarter cultured class left because they saw what was coming. They immediately escaped. The second wave was the socialists who set fire to the country because socialists were the ones who started all this. The Islamists never dared talk about revolution until socialists brought basically is famously, and we also have a hybrid of Islamo-socialist socialists who would uh, basically read Quran and Hadith and interpret them into Marxist messages. And they called themselves Islamist Marxists. M-E-K, uh, Mujahideen group is the most famous one. And uh, so the second wave were these people, the revolutionaries, the fascists who believed in everything that this regime believes, but they wanted to be in power. And the regime beat them. They did the revolution together, but the regime beat them. Most of those moved to Europe, to European countries. Germany is like the one of their biggest like uh, hubs. Then there was a movement, a big move, a big uh, wave during the Green Movement and afterwards. Basically, Iranians abroad, and there is also a massive group of Iranians abroad, especially in Canada, now that you ask, that started with Mulroney, if I'm not mistaken, or uh, before Harper, but Harper also continued it. The because the immigration in Canada was if you have a certain amount of money in your account, that would be basically acceptable. What they didn't think about was 
Okay, in a country like Iran with a government economy, whoever has that money in their account is probably connected to the regime. So Canada, that way Canada became the second largest, uh, basically money laundering country for the IRGC. That's how all those scandals happened and Harper. That's how what led to shutting down the embassy because the regime was really active in Canada. I just, I just want to interject here for a moment and let you know that that's also how we got a lot of Chinese mafia and also everybody, everybody. terrorists from India. <laughs> like, every country. That's, that every, strategy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. And, uh, but the majority of Iranians abroad are against the regime, but a lot of them have become uh, westernized. Basically, they're now just living their lives, lives a lot of them. And uh, they have like good life because Iranians are, from what I've read, it's like the highest educated, most one of the most income migrant groups in the West. So they people prefer to have a like a normal, nice life. But still, most of them are against it. Islam is not a big thing in Iran in general. It never was. It was a government thing. Uh, but since basically the Islamic conquest in Iran, Iranians basically work to undermine this whole thing. That's how Shiite became a thing. Basically, Shiite was Iranians' method to interfere with the religion and cause division in it. And uh, Iranians in general are not very religious. The families of the IRGC and the leaders of Iran who live in Canada and the United States and other places are, but majority of Iranians are against the regime. Now, there's the problem is a good chunk of them are still those socialists. And a lot of them are educated. They, their children are educated in Western universities with that whole intersectional, all those stuff, Islamophobia and all those things. So those are our problems. And they control most of the NGOs and most of the media, basically, landscape. They're the ones like Nayak in the United States, the lobby of the Islamic Republic, for decades, it was the source for Western politicians and all the media. They would invite these people. Then it turned out that, no, 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 they're all tied. They're all connected. So yeah, Iranians abroad are against it. They're not very relig religious at all. Uh, but the regime also has its forces. The regime also spends a lot of money abroad. Like Quds Day in Canada, when you see it, it's an Iranian thing. The regime, not an Iranian thing, it's an Islamic Republic thing. Khomeini started it, the Quds Day. So they spend a lot of money, fund these, and people come there. And for every person that they bring, they get some money. So you see families there with like children. It's like a picnic. They just come because they get money. So they, their activities is still here. The regime supporters have lost a lot of uh, ground, but our problem is still with the other type, the intersectional, the uh, DEI types. They're the ones who try to uh, basically uh, take over any movement that happens in Iran even though Iranians in Iran have caught on to it and they really act fast to discredit them, but it's still a thing. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, it was pretty good. Thanks. Thank you. So speaking of intersectionality, um, I wanted to talk to you about that experience that you told me about or that you wrote about on Twitter when you were at York University and you were in a gender studies class, correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. And you were talking about hijab. And um, it was, of course, your even, instructor yeah, was talking wasn't, about how, go ahead. It wasn't even like a, I was talking about it. It was, when I came here, I used to consider myself a feminist. So I used to translate like source material on like domestic abuse and all those stuff that we didn't have in Persian. So I used to translate. So when I came here, one of the things I wanted to do was where is Western thought right now? So I took gender studies, anthropology, and satire because I love satire and uh, literature. 
So gender studies was the one that really blew my mind. It uh, it was during a uh, with the TA. It was like a uh, question time, like discussion class, mm -hmm. discussion time. She said, mention in a form of question some of the symbols, possible symbols of patriarchy. So I asked the question, could hijab be considered a symbol of patriarchy? And 18-year-old girls got up in the class and called me a racist, a bigot, ignorant, and all sorts of things. And the professor is just watching. Now, the same professor later on, I mentioned like I, I had written something and one person misunderstood it. And I said, no, no, no. Uh, you misunderstood my point. What I'm saying is this. And the professor said, you can't tell her that. And I was like, tell her what? She said that she's wrong. And I was like, but she's wrong. That's not what I've written. And she was like, you can't say that. That's her interpretation. This professor allows them to just mob me in class, calling me racist, bigot, ignorant, and all sorts of things. And I was just like, wow, this is this is new. This is a new experience. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah. So obviously these people know that you come from Iran. You I'm sure you've expressed to them that this is no, a country I didn't really that talk forces... so much. They were oh, not interested okay. in me at all who I am. Wow. I was a man. So it did not interest them to know what my background is, what I am, or anything at all. I so was they just don't the representative. Hear any truth no. or facts or life no, no. experience no. around no. i had more laws. lively discussions in iranian universities wow i'm telling you because in iranian universities we knew the professors that we could talk to we knew the classes that we could talk in and the classes that we couldn't in here you just couldn't like in anthropology, I remember the professor came in and started pushing cultural relativism from the get-go. The first thing he says is uh, nationality is an imagined uh, concept. And I just raised my hand. I was like, what isn't in sociology? <laughs> Why are you beginning with nationality? And he was talking about ethnocentrism and how some cultural behaviors in other countries might sound weird to Westerners. And everybody was giving these cute answers. And I raised my hand and I said, honor killing. Mm -hmm. And it just died. <laughs> so yeah, after four months, I just quit because I had too many fights with professors. But yeah, I honestly yeah. said when I when I was I was talking to my friend, I was like, I guess the West had a good run. Like it was bound to happen. I guess they're now accepting that they should hate themselves and just go down. Okay. But yeah, I really was traumatized in York University. And I don't use that term lightly. <laughs> if you look at my experience, I don't use that term lightly. But I was like shocked, traumatized in York. I was like, what is happening? Because when you come here, you're starry eyed. You're like, oh, freedom and uh, whole free country and the freedom of thought and and then you go in there and it's like wham the professor is explaining to you how the first interracial kiss on tv in star trek is actually racist and it's like is like is that really like a thing that anybody should even think about ever in their life <laughs> it's happening to you Lack of problems, maybe I don't know, but yeah, it was mind blowing. Well, as a university professor in Canada, that's uh, truly depressing. But thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um. So your experience with all of this diversity inclusion efforts, you know, your disillusionment with the idea of the Canadian education system, but it turns out it's just an indoctrination system. And, um, you know, what what is it that you would like to express 
to the Canadian public right now. So you 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 have experienced Iranian prisons, you talked about being lashed, you talked about getting your face, you know, smashed into the ground and breaking your nose, and you didn't use the word trauma until you started referring to a, a university classroom in Canada. Because those stuff, like the prison thing, when like that, after that beating, I could say I was traumatized, but it's still, it was something that I could digest because of the context of where I was the country I was in and what I was doing, which I knew was against the regime and all that, it was still digestible. Okay, it wasn't fair. I didn't like, it was horrifying. It was embarrassing. It was humiliating being that powerless. But it was still in the context of I live under Islamic Republic. When you come with those like starry eyes, and you're ready to get into discussions and free discussions. What's what's that like? And then like 18 year olds who just left their home. Like they even have not had a year of independent life. They haven't had a life, experienced real life. They're allowed to just attack you like that. And they feel so comfortable doing so. And the university promotes it, allows it. It was just really, yeah. So what what would your message be to your fellow Canadians? I wrote this like a while ago. I wrote a joke. I was like, uh, every university has should have a course, mandatory course for graduation that they would send a student to a Islamic country under Sharia law. And six months, they have to live wow. with the people. And it should be called perspective, the course. And because what I'm looking at, like from somebody who came from outside, and I was so ready to become a Canadian, a patriot and all that, because I really liked Canada. I didn't just choose mm -hmm. Canada. From mm -hmm. its comedians to its history, I really liked this country. And... Uh, it was really weird to see, like, because Canada, in my opinion, has not gone through, it's a very young country, it hasn't gone through any national crisis for the people to feel united against a common threat. Because those are the things that bond a nation together, makes people feel like we're in this together. There's that enemy. Like America has created those artificially a lot in wars and such in the past. And uh, and they had 9-11, like all sorts of things. They tried to create that. And they war with each other. Yeah. East, but right it's still, left. it's because they're a young country and they never had really like national existential threat to their existence and to their way of life. They're, they've been very comfortable. They lived in a blissful ignorance ignorance is bliss and they have they've just trusted their politicians and their media and things were going okay for the most part so why risk it why change it why try to look at it differently why try to find out more and now they're in a position that their politicians are acting exactly against their their interest and but that feeling of I trust my politicians and institutions and everything, the most law abiding people I've ever seen in my life, Canadians. It's fascinating and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when your leaders are working against you, kind of, you have to wake up or you're going to go down. Because I explained it in the thing that when you bring masks, migrants from anywhere, it's just a fact of life. It's not like they're bad people. It's just what happens. That when you bring a lot of people from a certain culture, they come together and they stick together because they don't understand the country. They don't understand language. They don't know what's what. So they stick together. That immediately creates a culture within your culture, a very strong culture, not some aspects of culture that sp sporadic migrants bring. They bring that whole culture in their community there. 
the families of the girls in those communities who want to do this and that, they're suppressed. They're pressured by the other family. That culture is now here. Now they expand, they, they grow in numbers. They start affecting your politics. And your state, your laws, your way of life is not designed to deal with citizens who hate everything about you. Mm -hmm. It's just not designed that way. So if you want to actually do something, you have to break your own laws. And you can't. Because they understand your laws too. Like the first people who learned how to speak leftist was the Islamic Republic mm -hmm. in the modern era. It was like they learned how to speak leftist because a lot of they them created had studied... the term Islamophobia, yep. knowing Islamophobia that it was going was... to suppress. Yeah. Wasn't that a very smart move? It mm -hmm. was like, no, 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 it's just bigotry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're marrying, like, you're allowing marriage to like nine year olds. That, that's cultural things. Mm -hmm. They're dragging mm -hmm. this girl in Iran by her hair on the floor and kicking her. That's she's it's culture. What are you talking about? If it was the culture, she wouldn't in all these people wouldn't be tens of thousands wouldn't be in prison. Just and who prison. cares? Who cares if it's the culture? As if cultures people are have dynamic. the right to change their culture. Yeah, absolutely. And their cultures have changed and their cultures have progressed. But it's like they're, they they don't see other cultures as being allowed to be to progress and be dynamic just like theirs. You have to other, stay the way you are otherwise. Exactly. Because yeah. another thing is it's all about virtue signaling. Mm -hmm. It's not actually about doing anything because doing things is hard. Doing things requires you to actually get off your butt and go out in the world and do things. That's difficult. Like you have to go talk to this member of parliament, that member of sent letters, do this, do that. Just add a rainbow flag to your profile picture. And go to but one if anybody protest. tries, that's it. But if anybody tries that's to it. talk about, okay, what about the Islamic countries that are killing people for being gay? It's like, no, 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 we can't talk about that because that's Islamic. No, that's their culture. That's, that's their culture. A, yeah, yeah. And the thing is, they do, honestly, at this point in time, because the Islamic revolution in Iran like a lot of like, OK, I don't know if I should get into this, but like you've heard of the Mossadegh and the coup in Iran, the CIA coup in Iran. Mm -hmm. That never really happened. Mm -hmm. What happened was, first of all, they Any say of the story is about Mossad <laughs> never happened. The democratically <laughs> elected prime minister. No, he so wasn't. The constitution mm -hmm. of Iran at the time was. The Shah appoints the prime minister. Not the parliament. The Shah appoints the... That was the constitution. It was a semi-democracy, not a democracy. Shah appoints the prime minister. And then the prime minister dissolves the parliament because the parliament goes against him and people are rioting against the guy around the country. He establishes uh, martial law Police is beating people in the streets because he's destroyed the economy because he kicked out the Brits and Brits said, OK, we're not going to buy your oil anymore. And this idiot didn't think that, oh, we don't have any other customer than Brits. Mm -hmm. So he just destroys the economy. People are mass protesting and the sh he dissolves the parliament because he asked the parliament for more power. The parliament refused. So Mossadegh dissolves the parliament and according to the Constitution, when the prime minister dissolves the parliament, the king has the rule, has the uh, right to remove the prime minister until election and appoint an interim prime minister. That is the constitution of Iran. So the king did just that because the country was really in turmoil. The king removes him and appoints somebody else. Mossadegh says, I'm not going. He arrests the messenger and says, I'm not leaving. So what happens is the army of Iran removes him from power. The heads of Iranian army gathered together, had a meeting 
and removed him from power. Mossadegh was the first person who brought Soviets into Iranian politics. He was the first person who brought Islamists into Iranian politics. His ally was Ayatollah Kashani. He became prime minister because the two previous prime ministers in Iran who were opposing him were assassinated by the Islamic fund first Islamic fundamentalist terrorist group Fadayun. Okay. Sorry, I don't want to you're, you're going sorry, down sorry. a rabbit hole now. I'm going, down a rabbit hole. But, <laughs> I'm going to but pull these, you out of the rabbit hole. Yeah, so these just lies to... they just keep going and going and the yeah. same thing their culture it's like no it's not it's really not so your it message never to will. the canadians or your message to the western world is that what we are all human beings and to stop identifying people by their culture stop doing this cultural relativism cultural relativism is poison mm -hmm. anyone who's pushing cultural relativism is your enemy even if they don't know it they are existentially your enemy. Your country is established and it's working like this. This has these rules and laws and traditions because you people lived in it and you turned it this way because it fits your life, the way of life. Mm -hmm. It's not because it was unfair. It fits your way of life. People who don't believe in any of it, when you bring them, of course, they're going to try to change it. To yeah. the way they feel that's not just unfortunately that's happening all over Europe right now. We can see it in the UK happening quite uh Everywhere. terrifyingly. Yeah. Um, so what is your hope for the future of Iran? Where do you where do you see how do you see this ending or how do you see this progressing? Uh oh, sorry, I think I forgot to mentioned the the 30 trader thing it was basically we were, sorry just to get back quickly uh we wrote a letter to obama in 2013 telling opposing the uh jcpoa the nuclear deal uh -huh. telling him not to make a deal with the regime we got hammered for it five years later trump came to power and we wrote the same letter to trump this time, all of the regime's apparatus, the reformists abroad, all these NGO people, all the lefties, they all attacked us, called us like Israeli agents and traitors. And the IRGC's newspaper put our pictures, the 30 of us, on its front page mm. with a big picture of Trump. I have the picture if we want. Uh, and it was like 30 traitors. And uh, yeah, that's how it happened. And uh, But a year later, people came in the streets said the same thing that we were saying so we were redeemed basically mm -hmm. sorry your last question your uh, next question was what was yeah i want to know how you oh what is your hope for the future of iran well it's a very the most complex area in the world it's and the regime has done a lot of harm to its neighbors so a lot of that a lot of bad things so iranians in iran have made their decisions like the street has made its decision all the trends like if you check instagram which is the only one open in iran people have made their decisions they know what they want they know who they want they know what path they want now abroad is a different story but i don't care about that the, we always say order comes from the street the hope is that we get to uh, like maybe some maybe some IRGC officials decide to flip, but that would only happen if the West stops funding the regime. Mm -hmm. This is the only reason I basically was like I supported Trump. The only reason he's not the president of my country nothing but he was the only one who was like no 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 you don't talk to these people you just show force to them yeah. if the west and that applies to everything about your previous question that if the west wants to fix islamist problem the islamic jihadism problem it needs to punch it in the face appeasing an islamist this is what happens they go to their meetings and whatever and say the enemy is scared 
The enemy is weak. Yeah. The enemy is weak, and this is the time. We are winning, brothers, because mm -hmm. in their mind, you're the enemy. It's because mm -hmm. you are what you are that you're their enemy. Unless you become what they want, you're not mm -hmm. going to. You muted yourself again. Become what they want or stand like look at Saudi Arabia and Emirates and all. What did they do? Did you see the video of that uh, fundamentalist imam in Saudi Arabia getting dragged and beaten by intelligence agents because he was uh, basically he forgot that times have passed? And he was saying the previous chants and against like Israel and death, whatever, and oh. all that stuff. There's a video oh, of him. I didn't they, see this. They mm. drag him out of the mosque while beating him. Mm. That's mm. a message. Okay. Islamists, the only thing I understand is power. Okay. You mm. can't win. So either you can change, become softer, or I will destroy you and they will become softer. That's how Christianity changed, basically. It was the states basically saying, no, 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 no more. You're not going to have power anymore. So Trump understood that if the regime loses its source of money, which is the oil, it the Middle East immediately becomes more peaceful. You saw under Trump, there was nothing going on. Every once in a while, one rocket here, one rocket there, just so we're, we still exist. But nothing happened. Why? Because they knew this guy is crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he exploded Ghassem Soleimani, the second yeah. most powerful man in Islamic Republic. He killed him. Khamenei cried that night. Mm -hmm. so the only way for Iran to become better is for the West to stop funding this regime. And the rest, I feel like, will fall into place. It will mm -hmm. fall into place because people are ready. People are united in Iran. And they know what they want and they know what they don't want. So all these steps, maybe some army people defect, some IRGC people, but all of that depends on them realizing we're going down. The ship is sinking and destruction is imminent. That's the so only I'm, time. I'm happy to hear you say that the Iranians are united because that's unfortunately, you know, that's, I would like Not to see that. Media I would like here. to hope that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, because no. this is my this is my frustration right now is I feel like I see a lot of infighting going on with the Iranian community. I'm not Irani and I can't read Farsi and I'm not privy to all of it, but what I do see is very frustrating to me. I feel like can we just all stay united against demolishing this regime and then then they have can. the petty arguments later? Like, can we just save that for after? What's going to be the second step? Why are we asking about the second step now? You know what well, I that's mean? It's like, problem. let's deal with the first step first. That's the problem. A lot of the legacies of the 1979 revolution, that ideology still exists in the activist groups here. Mm -hmm. And they're still defending the revolution. They're saying, oh, we just went wrong, but the revolution was justified. But now we have all the documents and evidence that it was the biggest Soviet PSYOP, like the two-day party had 40,000 members. They were all working for Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Shah has created, had created OPEC. Middle East was becoming literally a superpower by monopolizing oil. That was Shah. You think the West loved that about Shah? And they say he was a puppet. And no, Soviet Union was very dominant at the time. It was the Cold War. So... That legacy still exists. So what the fighting you see is between these two. But on Instagram, in the streets, if you see, there's only one name being chanted. There's only one person's photo being hung from streets. While you're, you know if they catch you, you're going to probably be executed. They're hanging pictures in the streets, chants on the walls. There's one way that in Iran, over 80% have agreed on it. It's what is outside. It? It's the Pahlavi, the crown prince, not mm -hmm. necessarily as the monarch, but as the leader of the movement. And does For he him, want to be the leader of the movement or does he well, want to stay living in America? No, he 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 want he. Well, that's the thing. He is 
a very uh, smart and uh, interesting person. He's he already he said it many times. They said, "Hey, why don't you defend monarchy?" He was like, "It's not my job to defend it. If people want it, people will defend it. I can't come and say I want to be your king. I can't do that. I should. This is embarrassing. I will serve." at whatever capacity you want me to. Mm -hmm. He said this many times. If you just want me to be the voice, I will be the voice. If you want me as a president, I will. you can elect me as president. Whatever people decide, free election. But that other side has already said, no, monarchy should not even be on the ballot. They've said this many times. So you can't really negotiate with somebody who says, no, this option of yours, which most of the people in the street have apparently backed is not on the menu. And then you're like, and the, other, you? the other people are saying what, that they want a democracy, Republic democracy. And it's like, yeah, monarchy could become a dictatorship. And it's like, have you seen the Middle East or Africa? All of them are republics. It's not about the form of the government. It's about what you do with your constitution and checks and balances. The most, the happiest countries on earth, they're all constitutional monarchies. So um, Sarah, who yeah. is an Iranian, um, is uh, has her hand up. So Sarah, please go ahead. Hi, Yasmin. Hi, Siavash. So Hi. I just wanted to counter because you just said that like 80% of people want a monarchy and we don't have- that was a a point. There was a po there was a few polls that as much as we can, can trust them. And then you can respond because the poll you are referring to, I didn't see it. My circle of friends don't want a monarchy. We don't believe in a monarchy. We still believe that the revolution was railroaded by the Islamists. It was necessary. It will be necessary. And you said that they call his name and he doesn't like number one he has said that he wants to be the king from afar and live in the u.s and travel to iran no he's never I've, said that no, no. okay I've are seen, we going to make up things or are we no, going to I've seen, the, I've seen the i've seen the video i'll find it and i'll send it to you on twitter and i'll send it to yasmin on twitter as well and i don't want this to be combative or anything no You're he what he is, actually said was not was literally i will not be I, I don't want to be just an executive and I don't want to just to be a uh, symbol. He just said I that will work culturally. In Iran, uh, uh, look, just in Iran, because his friends and his family are in the US and he'll travel back and forth if necessary. If necessary, yeah. So what so, does that mean? He doesn't want to no, be a kid again, in Iran? You're moving, you're moving past that. What we're talking about right now is the face of the revolution, is the spokesperson for the revolution. He's not he, it. He is. We would love for him to Majid, be it. Majid Tavakoli and oh, everyone what? in Iranian prisons mm -hmm. tell yeah. us from Iranian prisons that over 80% of prisoners, political prisoners in Iran, we have their message. What are you talking about? They yeah. say that 80% in Iran say Pahlavi is the only person they trust in prison. Too. I can make up polls too. No, of my this is from Iranian prisons. Because he wants the IRGC to give him a coup. If he had the spine, if he wasn't so spineless and he had the spine to actually lead this revolution, we wouldn't be here. He doesn't yeah, have sure. it. He's not sure. it. He, does, he sure. wants to be a monarchist. He's a monarchist. In okay. And you Absolutely. Can... What's Absolutely. That You're very right. Okay. Yeah. You're right. So. What what I'm seeing here is basically what I was referring to before is the... I have a question. Oh, no, sorry, Sarah, question. go ahead. No, no, it's okay. I'm not going to ask it anymore because this is the reaction I'm getting. Well, and this you is not, made I'm, a I'm, statement. You you brought up stuff. I brought up brought stuff. Up stuff I'm lying. So there no. is no conversation going. No, I'm not saying That's you're it. lying. She, I'm yeah, you did. I do not it's agree it. with your perspective. No, I'm saying because people... It, that's what prominent happened. political prisoners in Iran have said that in Iranian prisons, over 80% of political prisoners are pro Halavi as the head of the revolution, not monarch, head of the revolution. He's That's not, what, though. 
he the, and you can make up numbers people can no, make up okay numbers. okay There's it's very no easy actual to call. the most popular what is the most popular instagram account iranian instagram account are we going by social media now yes yes is because we don't have you don't believe the polls you don't believe the polls so you just the only thing you have is your circle of friends and i'm sorry but that's less acceptable than at least social media that's ali kalimi is the say. biggest uh, no it's uh, you're anecdotal you're talking anecdotes i'm talking about Who millions are you? no yeah. ali kalimi Ali Karimi is the biggest. Oh, he's another misogynist who calls women prostitutes for going out on the street in their skirts and trying to create. You said right from you're the start. You're lying. You're just lying now. He calls us pra parastu. What is that? What does no, that parastu. Mean? Parastu That's is a term exactly for a the regimes for the regimes supporters. And we he need... decides which ones are it and which ones are not it. So we. Okay, these are personal so issues. Are we going to talk? on social media are called prostitutes by him he wants no us that's a lie there. that's a lie no it's not it is it is you can say that but it's not it no I it's can, a lie i, I can, can tell you who is called parastu the type of person who called parastu women good looking women with good looking photos who come and support the regime those are called parastu can we uh i don't know I, I, am i going to debate yeah, i'd like to move on no i bring up facts and uh, i was wondering so sarah did you have a specific question or did you want to just move on i thank you yasmin just move on thank you yeah let's move on okay. i'm not going to answer that any okay thing. so it, it's very Somebody clear that the there's lawyers. that there's a lot but of infighting I going can on give you... with the pahlavi supporters versus those who are looking for democracy but my question is how about you unite and get rid of this regime first no, and then because have these the, arguments yeah. afterwards because this divide and conquer is such a you know a tale as old as time strategy that's happening right now and i no, feel I like understand. it's slow you both agree that the islamic regime needs to go even though you disagree with what happens next but this there is are a gift to them right now no i understand and that's why the regime basically has spent the past few months creating extensive anti-pahlavi propaganda in the streets in tv every channel on tv well in of its course he's going to do that because it's a threat because to his power. no because 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 the regime knows who the actual opposition is the enemy is the rest are the, the same people who are now attacking Pahlavi. The same people were the ones who said we should vote for the reformists. We should for, vote for Rouhani. We should for these are people who are politically not very informed. They go with emotions and they keep getting duped. And people in Iran, again, Instagram is the sample. The biggest Iranian Instagram account who only writes in Persian is Ali Karimi. He's a football player. He has about 17 million something followers. None of them are foreigners because he just writes in Persian. Every tweet he makes about the Pahlavi gets over a million likes and hundreds and tens of thousands of comments. These are okay, actual. I'll, I'll I, I, I will accept no, your point. Nothing that... even close. Like, the okay. biggest account on the other side gets one twentieth of that. So sure. it's not about us going to them and saying, please come with us. It's like, no, you have to come with the majority if you want to overthrow what, the regime. And, and what has Pahlavi done now that he knows that 80% of the country is behind him? What has he, he done? He has gone to, to Israel. To he has met. He has been doing all sorts of visits and meetings with different uh, heads of states. His visit to Israel, these the same people so attacked he, him. He, for it, going he to... does want to replace the regime. He is. Oh, I, oh, he's he's been pushing against the regime since ever when everybody was voting for Demo for re, uh, reformists and everybody. He was his videos are there. He's talking. He's basically going on different channels, saying, but nobody would hear him because there was no communication at the time there was no internet there was nothing so and the reformists had the upper hand they exported a lot of their activists abroad and they infiltrated a lot of media like bbc persia which we know the biggest trend 
in Iranian Twitter was Ayatollah BBC from Iranian Twitter that came out because all of the reformists journalists exported from Iran went to BBC. Okay, I'm, so, I think we've gone off on a tangent. So what I'm what I'm mm -hmm. asking now is if 80% of the country is supporting Pahlavi to replace the regime, is, because for, the is, is he prepared to do that? Is he taking a leadership role in getting rid of the regime? Well, there is only certain things he can do. He has, again, he's meeting with the leaders of different countries. He saw, he visited Israel, which was attacked severely by the the, the other side. He uh, visited with the uh, different conservatives, senators, congressmen, uh, NGOs in United States, in Europe, members of European Parliament. He is doing what he can do, and he's pushing for sanctions on the regime to not fund the Islamic Republic that the Biden admin did and uh, stuff like that. As long as there is no song, but well, he doesn't have an army. He can't just march the regime. All he can do from outside is just go around and convince like what Desmond Tutu did, basically. Mm -hmm. Just going around and convincing leaders to sanction the IRGC and the Islamic Republic. And guess who opposed the sanction of IRGC and the, Islam, I, I, the entirety of IRGC in Canada? Yeah. The same people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Who well, supposedly you know, opposed the regime. If 80% of the country is behind him, and if he is actively trying to get the, if he is actively leading the call to get the regime out, um and wants to replace them um then that would be good news you know obviously that would be a best case scenario it's unfortunately it yeah it, it's and it and it would be a Twitter. done it's deal Twitter. if 80 percent of the people are supporting him then it would be a done deal it would you wouldn't yeah. need to bother yourself with the 20 percent that are maybe socialists or communists we or we don't whatever but they have all the media and NGOs in the west so they are very loud but in iran as i said like it's obvious what's happening the trends in instagram yeah. the biggest trend that came out of iran in instagram in the past like six months was young people taking photos with pahlavi with muhammad reza Shah. Right. yeah i think that at this point um People are just looking for another leader. They want somebody yep. to lead them. Yep. You know, there's a, it, it's democracy, I think, is a big step for some people. They freedom is scary. You know, it's it's a bit too yep. much. Secularism well, is scary true, yeah. for some, you know, no, the, the, Islamic the, dictatorships, the, too, sometimes. The three yeah. things that uh, Pahlavi basically, the, when they pressured these groups, pressured for a, a coalition the three things that uh, the conference basically said these are my three uh conditions the integrity of the country so no separatists first thing was a free election second was secular democracy and third was integrity land integrity who who said this? The crown prince said, "If you want free to... election, a crown prince no, wants free election." For, no, for the other groups to join in a coalition with him, because they were pressuring, "Why aren't you accepting us as coalition?" And he was like, "If you believe in these three conditions, that when the regime goes, free election, mm -hmm. secular democracy, whatever the form may be, people will mm -hmm. decide in a free election." But secular mm -hmm. democracy and land integrity, these mm -hmm. three, and mm -hmm. none of them could accept. Mm -hmm. None of them could accept that. So people in Iran see this. So whatever mm -hmm. people say, like, oh, they're not democratic. No, land integrity for Iranians is a big thing. Mm -hmm. It's massive. So they're not going to negotiate with them, with people who still support the revolution in Iran. 
when we know just a few reforms, the only thing reason revolution happened was because the fundamentalists and socialists got scared because the country was skyrocketing economically. Literally, there's conversations of Iranian socialist writers from that time. They're saying every day there is a festival and party. Everyone's dancing and celebrating. This is embarrassing. This is insulting. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. the mentality of the revolutionaries who gave the country to Ayatollah Khomeini, the guy who has rules in his book about how to wash your butt and what happens if you have sex with a donkey. Okay. These intellectuals gave the chose that guy as the leader, these socialists and all yeah. these chose that guy right. as the leader. So people are there right now like, you know what? You should be if you believe that revolution was great, you should be quiet in general about Iranian politics. If mm. you believe the revolution was good, but it was just it just went bad afterwards. No, the revolution happened because Khomeini became the leader of the revolution and Ayatollah. Otherwise, it would not have happened. Mm. Because yeah, Khomeini started to yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot there, but we're there's we've been there. talking for a long time. Yeah, there's yeah. there's so much more that could be said, but we're not going to get uh, we're not going to solve anything today. But but this is a really good discussion, and it's good to hear yeah. two sides of the story. Sarah, I'm sorry that you couldn't really get your point across very well, but you know, obviously, everybody's opinion matters in this situation. This is your country just as much as it's Siavash's country. And you both feel very passionate and feel a lot of love and feel a lot of hope for the future of your country. Um, it's just very frustrating that, you know. I'm telling you, I'm very. The uh, infighting. Happy. I'm very happy. I'm very uh, positive because I see I have connect a lot of connections inside. I talk to yes. journalists. They, you know Good. what they okay. tell me? This They're telling me. You guys are wasting, you guys are fighting for BS. The next uprising, you'll see people will declare what their path is. You're just wasting your breath. That's fine. Things it doesn't, it, it, I just, I just care about getting this regime out. That should just be everybody's concern right now. And whatever the path to that, whatever is going to help that happen is the path that everybody should be on. I don't see Pahlavi really engaged in that very much. I see him doing a little bit of, you know, diplomacy Because he doesn't want to there. force himself as a leader. Right, but if, yeah. I'm just saying, if he ends up being the leader, you know, then that's great because it's not gonna be as bad as the way things are now. Even though obviously I would prefer for any country to be a democracy over a monarchy, that's not. Oh no, no! Decision. When we're talking monarchy, we're talking constitutional monarchy, not monarchy. Right. No, no. That I thought that was a given. When we're talking monarchy, it's constitutional monarchy. His first thing was free elections, uh, secular democracy. Right. That so, was his so first like, thing. Like Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, Tochi. There go are ahead. no monarchy. <laughs> yeah. Just um. Y'all been talking about this guy, and I don't know who you're talking about. So I just wanted to know what is, what's his full name, so I can Google him. Reza Pahlavi. Oh, the guy that was the last, the son of the last Shah. Yes, exactly. The Crown uh, Prince of Iran. So, so a lot of people are just wanting to rewind the clock to the pre-Islamic regime, and then just to go back to that point in time where mistakes were made and the Islamic regime got into power because of the support through, from the communists and the socialists. Um, and so people, a lot of Iranians just want to rewind the clock, go back to there and not make that mistake, get rid of the Islamic regime, go back to square one, go back to the um, to the, to the monarchy. Basically. So uh, my, my question is a slightly just broader, right? Um, you've mentioned that um, most, well, there, that there is a difference between sort of the attitudes of Iranians who are in diaspora versus those who are at home, which is understandable. Um, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is overall, what's 
you know, in totalitary, like in totality, what's the sentiment in terms of this ongoing Middle East conflict in terms of the Israel Hamas war, right? Um, do they realize knowing that if they are in fact against Islamists that they should be on the side of Israel or are their socialist leanings preventing them from being on the side of Israel? Do you know what I mean? It's, it's an interesting yeah, question. I, I understand. I understand. And it's a very, the, the, this is a very good question. They're, question they're, yeah. the, the thing is, because Iranians in Iran, again, there uh, a lot of diaspora here are out of touch. Because Iranians in Iran came out in droves, and since 2017, their chant has always been no to Gaza, no to Lebanon. And after this conflict happened, they literally in stadiums, like Azadi Stadium, 100,000 uh, audience chanted because the regime brought the Palestinian flag after the October 7 to gather support in the stadium. A hundred thousand people, there's video of it, I can send it to you, chanting, shove that Palestinian flag up your, uh -huh, up your butt twice. <laughs> that was the sentiment from Iran. That's it. When the regime draws the Israeli flag in the floor, in the doors, on the doors, on the road, so people have to walk on it, people walk around it. American and Israeli flag. People have decided, but the problem is the diaspora here, a lot of them are, again, educated in Western universities. They're taught to hate the West also. So they can't really reconcile, but because the force was so big from Iran, they really didn't go on the offensive and openly supporting the Palestinians. But they haven't said much. Some of them still say stuff like oh but it is unfair and whatever but they don't take a strong stance because they know people in iran have made it very clear what they think and what they look at so yeah that group has been mostly silent if if i can add um on an even larger uh note um so my background i i went to school in saudi i lived all over saudi Tobok, Riyadh, taif jetta the whole night so um and I remember when I came back to Canada in 2002, I was the only person, like I went to Queens and I was the only person from Saudi or around Saudi Arabia or anything. Um, but around, but to be fair, there were some people from Saudi Arabia who were trickling in. Um, and I do remember that. And that was a whole really interesting situation because the people who were coming in were people with a lot of money. Some of them I knew who were very anti-West even then. And I was like, how is Canada mm -hmm. letting them in? I, it, but I we understood it was money. That's just what it was. So my point is, but fast forward like 10 years, I'm starting to see, you know, even Saudis. I was, I was shocked to see like Saudi kids and stuff who are going to here in Toronto, going to university and things like that. And just being like, wow, like y'all are actually out here living and that kind of thing. So I guess what I'm trying to say is overall, um, we, we're definitely having an influx of... And, and, we were definitely having an influx of a lot of Muslim folk, right? And I, I don't, I don't have a problem with people believing whatever they want to believe necessarily, even though I'm a non-believer. So by default, I'm not a fan of any religion. But um, I'm, I'm kind of wondering how to, how to view some of the the kids who are kind of coming up now, who, in my opinion, almost they, they kind of. They behave in a way that's contradictory to me, because it's like on one hand you you're you're benefiting from Western society and Western freedom, and you want to be here, but on the other, on the other side, like you're still holding on to these ideas that are clearly uh, detrimental to everything Western, and in fact you're act you're advocating for the destruction of other places that are trying to be Western, which is a weird place to be, and I wonder are you at some point going to shift like i mean like since you live here in canada with me um is it i'm going to wake up one day and all of a sudden there's you know you make up 40 percent of the population now all of a sudden yep. it's, it's a prayer call right like that i yep. used to see and stuff and used to <laughs> used to live you know so uh, am i being paranoid like in terms of no. that could no be that's a very natural really? thing that's a very natural thing that's uh every kid immigrant kid goes through the identity crisis phase so you have two choices, either choose the identity of the new country, like America has been very successful in that, Americanizing immigrants, 
or you go to university the university says this identity is shit this country's identity is garbage everything they told you against this culture in your former country in your culture everything bad they told you about this is true so naturally the kids are going to go with that with the, okay no this is my identity and the community accepts it it's cooler in university it's cooler so that's a natural thing that happens it's a confusion of the next generation by the universities and mass immigration i think it's very natural yes and do you and, see that and you're uh, not paranoid it is happening it, it is happening okay fair enough it but i mean like you, crazy. Do, you, do you think that um I mean, do you feel that, and ultimately there's always going to be a little bit of conflict and things like that, and then people start to maybe figure it out. So um, are you optimistic? Are you cautiously optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Like what's your overall stance on that? Yasmin, are you optimistic? Yasmin? Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I am, I am not optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think that going yeah. back to what Siavish was saying before about there's a lot of self-hate that's baked into the West that we're baking into our children. Um, and there's so so remember when Siavish was talking about how the people that come from other countries and they come and they live together and they live in their communities and it's very tight, it's very strong, it's very um you know, it's a very well, strong, well. tight knit community. The culture is strong, but the culture around that community is weak because these kids are being raised with hate yourself, basically. Hate yourself if you're white, hate yourself if you're from the West, hate yourself if you're straight even. So there's a lot of that going on and it's countering people that are told that they are the best of humanity that they are the strongest of humanity, that the almighty Allah is behind them, that they are, you know, any any signs that they see around them all the time are signs that they are successful and they are succeeding and, and they are winning and they are stronger. Even if it's not the truth, that's what they tell themselves all the time. Um, there's absolutely zero sense of, of guilt, like, you know, that <laughs> sense of white guilt that's very common. You're not going to find that from Muslim families or, or Muslim communities, the Arabs especially. There's there's zero um, guilt over the, the the slave trade that the Arabs were involved in for so long before the Europeans even got involved into it. Um, the and after you know the, and after exactly it it only stopped because they were forced to by the by the UK who wouldn't uh, help them get the oil out of the ground unless they stopped buying and selling human beings. Um, so they, there's no guilt over these things. There's no there's there's just strength. They just feel a sense of superiority constantly. Um, and so you know what Siavish was saying there about you know these 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 kids are being born. Um, third culture kids they're being born in this basically on a on a bridge between two cultures and their choices should i join the one that is you know is self is self proclaiming itself to be weak and useless and horrible and bad and and the worst of example of of you know what civilizations are or should i join this one that is actually the other guys are even telling me that this one is cooler and it's stronger and it's more successful and they're reading fucking letters of bin laden on tiktok going wow i see it now you know um and it's trendy and it's hip and it's cool and i'll put a hijab on and i'll get all this attention and i'll start to connect with some country that I've never set foot in, but I'll just say that I'm from there because that makes me cooler than saying I'm Canadian or I'm American or whatever. Um, and so they're they're choosing that, you know, and we're we're pushing them towards that. Not only is the the, the Islamic community pushing towards pushing them towards that, but the Western community is pushing them towards that. You know, the 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 
so that's why I'm not optimistic. I wish I wish I were because I'm actually, you know, hopelessly optimistic about a lot of things. Um, but I, but I'm not about this. I'm not. And, but but we really need to reverse this self hate loop that we've got ourselves in anyway. Not just because of the yeah um, of the Islamists in our countries, but it's just incredibly damaging. It's damaging. a gift to Russia. It's a gift to China. And it's a it's a gift to the Islamists, but um, yeah, we're raising our kids to with with a lot of chips on their shoulders, and it's 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 pretty scary. It's like uh, like mass immigration brings it naturally by with itself. America used to get like a certain amount of immigrants, and it would spread them out all over the country. So what happens is these kids go into American schools. They get, they have to find American friends. So they become Americanized. When you bring a community, they, why would they go outside of it? It's easier to hang out with their friends inside. And the universities just basically confirm what they already believe. There's, it's like very, very, like it's just masochism. There is no logical explanation for this. It's None. very frustrating for us to see this happen. You know, when you're when you're escaping from one darkness and you think you're going to the light, like Siavish said, you know, he came to Canada, he had all this hope, you know, I'm coming to this free world full of free expression and free speech and free everything. And then you come here and it's like, what the fuck? Seriously? Like you had all the tools for success, and yet I'm I'm I, you know, there's, it's so similar to what we escaped from in so many ways. You know, there there's there's just yeah, it's another form of totalitarianism. And the thing is, honestly, one thing I'm afraid of, like this is going to get bad, mm -hmm. and when it gets to a certain point, then you're gonna have a backlash. But that that backlash yeah. is not going to be nice and polite no. it's going to be tribal it's going to be yeah. violent it's yeah. going to be and we're screwed bad. either way us brown skinned yeah. people we're screwed yeah. in either direction yeah. they're not so, going to ask yeah. you, oh, so what do you believe again it's not going to be that kind of backlash no. it's going to be like no. yeah get rid of all these whatever's yeah. and uh well i mean it's natural it's sad but that's the natural thing that I see, like extension of it. That's what's going to happen. They're going to take it. And it's already it happening slowly yeah. throughout Europe, like you, you know, and and it's going to continue. And it's uh, it's probably going to happen even in Canada, you know, where we we don't even have a right wing, and yep. you know, but it will grow because it will grow out of anger, out of animosity, out of self preservation. When um, it affects and... people's daily lives, that's when ordinary people react and they usually react badly. People who yeah. don't pay attention until it's late, they react badly. Those are the mob yeah. with the pitchforks and the... Because <laughs> they're reacting out of just fear, just pure fear. Yeah. They're not thinking. It's not, it's just emotion. It wasn't a gradual thing for them. It just happened. Yeah. 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 They didn't you know, pay attention. This was I was going to add, you know, it's interesting, my my father, because um, my father lived in, you know, was working in Saudi for decades. But I remember, I can't remember if it was, I mean, this was years ago. So we're like maybe mid 2000, maybe tw mid 2010s. But I remember there was an election that could have even been, um, it could have even been the federal one. But anyway, the point is, my father um, went and voted, he voted conservative, which I thought was interesting. Um, even though he's a well, he's sort of conservative liberal, but the point is, the reason why he did at this and this was years ago was because of um he was like the um, he was talking about the Islamists. He's like they're they're coming in and they're just changing everything, and and I thought he was crazy, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's it's really interesting because I was like, oh, they're they're just using that as a as a political tool or whatever. But I look back and my father was absolutely right. Um, yeah. and it didn't hit me obviously until. Um, this whole conflict started and then now everything I'm just it's it's making me just revisit my entire like life growing up you know in, in Saudi yeah. and all that stuff and seeing it um, to the point where um, yeah it's already it's already happened and in fact 
uh, it was kind of happening under our noses. Um, yeah. And so some some of us are being aware, but I think a lot of people are just not aware of it or they're not even really necessarily paying attention. That's exactly to right. Yeah. Your dad was only, your dad was aware because he knew, because he'd lived in Saudi Arabia for decades. So he understood it and he could see it. But most people wouldn't have his same perspective. Most people are just living in Canada and all they've ever, like, you know, they just... They'd be the ones that are like making sandwiches and have the big sign saying refugees welcome, right? Like they they're just kind hearted, good people, and they don't they don't recognize what's going on. That's the because thing. They don't they have the same perspective the as your dad. That's exactly yeah. the thing. Yeah. They use your kindness. Like, yeah. okay, in the past 20, 30 years, what group in the West, what political group? has just walked in the street openly punching people in the face. The anti-fascists. Yeah. So what are you going to do? I oppose these people. What? So you're a fascist? Like, what, what, like They're very smart in choosing things that if you want to take a position to them, you're going to be the bad guy. Easily. And uh, I, I'm really like... Yeah, I'm really worried. Like, what's going to happen? Because it's not going to be pretty. Can I ask? Sorry. Uh, also, um, I've asked a lot of questions. I don't want to dominate. This will be my no. last question. Um, but um, of all the Middle Eastern regimes um, and, and countries, which would you say is the most progressive? Progressive? I know. Like, like government-wise or like people-wise? Um, well, you can give me an answer for both. I'm curious, you know, like if there's real change going to happen, aside from Israel, really, I already know, I'm very familiar with Israel, but I'm saying like in general, the, the sort of the Arab countries, would you say are the, are the more... Arab countries, honestly, I haven't lived in Arab countries and uh, I've only lived in Iran, in Turkey and uh, Turkey was very interesting. Uh the east of it was basically very Muslim. The west of it was very secular, but they still had this romantic feeling towards Islam because it was suppressed by the government officially. So people had this emotional feeling towards Islam. I had a roommate who was a Turkish kid who used to drink every basic play guitar at a bar every night. That was his job. And he was talking to me about how Quran is great. And I was like, dude, you know, your whole existence is illegal under you know, yeah, it's like, around, like 100%. No, no, no drinking and no playing music. What are you talking about? <laughs> they just, I would say kept on. <laughs> the, the yeah. people of Turkey are quite often and Iran are open minded um, people. I didn't want to say as Iran as because that's the country I've lived in. Yeah. As far as governments are concerned, I would say the Emirati government. Now, I say yeah. that when they have in their Sharia to kill people for being gay and to, you know, imprison women for being raped. And they've got the, they've got the atrocious things. Um, but I say that only because there, I can see some positive progress happening with them currently because they are putting their, their financial interests above the above the hate so right now with the, yeah you know with making peace with israel um it's about that and saudi arabia was on its way to doing that as well which is part of the reason why iran needed uh october 7th to happen yep. was to just demolish yep. that to make sure that everything continued um you know to to continue to have the the, the fights between the Islamists and Israelis. They didn't want to see peace in the region um, because, of course, that's going to ruin their plans. Yep. So, um, but yeah, things were moving in the right direction. The Emiratis and the Saudis, Bahrain, like the, all of these Gulf area Arabs, except for Qatar, of course, um, yep. are generally against islamists because they are a threat to their power um and like it's a new policy though. was it's explaining policy, but it is yeah 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 the yeah. way i mean obviously i'm not going to agree with the way they're doing it but yes they completely shut down any imams that say anything that is 
anti-Semitic or that is uh, inciting violence or, you know, they can't talk about jihad and stuff like that because it's, um, like I said, it's a threat to their power. So they are, they work as good bulwarks against Islamists. Um, but, uh, but that's, you see, it's tough because the word progressive doesn't really, like socially, yeah. they are not progressive at all. But they are, I don't know, it's, it's at least. Well, Iranians, in the right I know for a fact that Iranians are the least religious. Yeah. I know that like for a fact that That's they're the least again one of those polls that our friend was saying no you can't trust those polls but one of those polls a few of those polls say like over 50 percent of Iranians are now not identifying as Muslim oh I thought it was more than that even well yeah. over 50 there was 57 percent there's again these polls are you can't really like be like this is the poll but 50 there is 57 to 70 we don't know but yeah. uh, a huge chunk of the society mm -hmm. a big chunk yeah One i see i see your comment and where you're like oh, i'm not sure yes but i'm not sure either but you're asking me to choose between you know piles of <laughs> i'm just choosing the least offensive pile but it's, it's certainly still a, an offensive pile of shit Look, don't get me wrong <laughs> like in turkey i lived two and a half years and Erdogan had just won an election, a second election. And he was very popular. He had the absolute majority. I remember six months into my uh, basically time in Turkey, Erdogan basically revoked, passed a bill removing the ban on the graduates of madrasas, the religious schools. Yeah in entering the police and the army at the time nobody paid attention mm. and i was like why why would he do that two years later when i was leaving turkey those same police officers were beating the crap out of people in istanbul yeah 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 it happens well, fast wants yeah, it happens fast, exactly. And it happened fast in Egypt, too. And it, it's it can happen fast anywhere. It's happening fast in the West. You know, when your dad saw it, nobody could see it. And now look, now everybody can see it. I think October 7th helped a lot of people to see things more clearly that they had not seen before. Um, but I was like your dad. I was one of those people that was like, I'm writing my book and I'm like, guys, pay attention. And they're like, oh, she's such an alarmist. You know, this one oh, woman I've who was, been, yeah. it, she I've was interviewing me, um, like she interviewed me after October 7th, but she was doing her research before October 7th. And she was telling me that when she was doing her research on me and listening to me in interviews, she's like, at the time when I was listening to you, I was thinking, wow, this girl is a bit much. And she's like, and now after October 7th, I'm like, whoa, that girl was prophetic, you know, but it just, it just takes that perspective yep. to be able to like, you have it, of course, living in Iran, you have it, of course, living in Saudi Arabia, but most of the people in the West don't have it. And they just, yeah. I had a gonna, friend here who was to be something bad. arguing with, over, with me over multiculturalism. Yeah. And how great it is. And I was like, unless it's natural and happens naturally over centuries, it's not something you can import. There has to be a basic foundation of culture and rule and basically traditions and whatever that everybody abides by and accepts. You so can that's add just some blasphemy for a Canadian yeah. to say that. Now that's... that friend of mine is basically kind of a white nationalist. Oh, my God. In a span of like five, six years. <laughs> Going yeah. from arguing okay. for multiculturalism, they're now basically against all immigration, all everything, basically. Yeah. Well, that's the this is exactly what we were talking about is when it yeah. when it turns, it's going to turn very badly in the other extreme. And yeah, yeah we're going to be caught in the middle either direction. We're caught in the middle. So. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. on that on that hopeful on note, that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> we're all gonna die. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's right. We're all fucked. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I just want to make sure that nobody in the in the chat here or in the group has any questions or comments for for Siavish before we conclude our conversation. Nice to see you all now. Good to see you too. I got the opportunity to take out the wine. <laughs> oh, nice. I see. I left. I I should have brought my wine too. You know, the only reason why I did it was because I was like, most of these people are on the west coast and it's going to be like too yeah. early for them and they're going to be like what the <laughs> fuck is this lush drinking at like 10 o'clock in the morning <laughs> but i shouldn't care about people i should have. oh yeah I, I i would have judged you <laughs> before oh, yeah. thinking about the time difference <laughs> yeah if i may add something though I, you know i agree with all the last things you said but one thing that we cannot do is like we cannot just like shove muslims back to the middle east and say oh yeah you know you know they can live there it's not gonna stay there you know and it's gonna come so it's a it's a fight that we have to fight either if you're in the middle east or you're here in the america or canada it's our fight still you're right yeah absolutely that's There's what no we're escape. basically fighting for and hopefully one day we're gonna win i'm gonna drink to that Inshallah. <laughs> cheers <laughs> I also say towards Islam being something that could be criticized like Christianity. If you want to cris criticize Christianity in either Canada or the US, it's fine. You criticize Islam and you're racist and horrible and... Oh right. no, if you criticize Christianity, you're edgy and cool. Exactly. Well, least, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if only. That would be a nice first step. <laughs> you know, that would be great. Yeah, and then that's once one you of can my... start talking about it like we, can, we can't even talk about things well, they so passed a you... law in canada they, they they passed a motion i think not a law but uh, yes. they added M103. islamophobia mm -hmm. like it's bigotry racism and islamophobia it's like why is this one separate yeah it was unanimously passed the motion was yep. unanimously passed and I spoke about it in the House of Commons along with so many other people, and thankfully it didn't continue. But we still have an Islamophobia minister. Like, you know, we're we're still we're still moving in that direction. So um, my friend from Iran called me and he's like, hijab day? Yeah. <laughs> she said, What did you do? I was like, I wasn't me. <laughs> You found out there's a job day in Canada and they were, their yeah. minds were blown. Yeah. Yeah, because you think that you think that this kind of stuff only happens under Islamic regimes, but they really these ideas travel in people's minds. Like you said, Almaz, you know, it's traveling across borders and these ideas are everywhere. And now we have to con like there's nowhere to go to hide to get away from it all it's it's here in our backyards and we have to continue fighting you know continue pushing yep. back against it and hopefully the people that are like-minded with us and have share the same values as us start to clue in as well and start to push back along with us that's the hope because right now they are the useful idiots that are making our job harder they're making it more difficult yep. for us making it more dangerous for us actually um, and so I think you mentioned we see it in Europe, right? They are starting. I, I've heard about segregation in Europe in the pools. And this is, this is horrible for us Iranian to hear because we live in this and we don't want that to become to the West. We want to, to push backward. So it's yeah. it, it's going more than what um, Tosh, Toshi's father imagined. Now it's like it's not about not criticizing in Europe, but also like actual no, accepting it. Yeah. Yeah, accepting some of those. Uh, yeah, exactly. Put it right. Mm -hmm. yeah, because that accepting was the whole it and thing. Celebrating they, it as even yeah, better. Yeah, they moved than... the goalposts. It was first tolerance. Tolerance yeah. was the chant of the day. Tolerance then mm -hmm. became acceptance and now celebration. Yeah. That's how they move things in the culture. It's like uh, mm -hmm. there used to be what? Social justice warriors then became woke. Now they're like, uh, diversity equity inclusion it's like it's just they're just changing the form because people catch up and they just change the name i don't know yeah i'm not well, uh, uh, very optimistic hopefully i don't know maybe they wake up and suddenly they're like yeah let's not 
vote that way ever again. But uh, there's three yeah. generations of university students who have been indoctrinated. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with those? Yeah, I think the, the pendulum is going to unfortunately probably have to swing in the opposite direction first. Or Iran, Russia, and China, their little alliance that's going on there is going to create that unity that you were referring to, Siavish. <laughs> Maybe that will create the unity of the Western world because we'll have this massive enemy against us. So I you know. don't know even if that helps because of the media landscape right now. People believe literally watch the same thing and have two very different interpretation of it. So mm -hmm. I honestly don't know what the past forward is. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I'm trying to end on a positive note, but I've got okay. a note here from wanna... Cindy that says, my son's public school in California had a World of Islam festival. When I questioned it, I was called a closed-minded racist and my son was singled out for harassment. Yeah. I've heard variations of this story okay, Cindy, you wanna... so many and... times. You want to end on a positive note? I can tell you like a funny story uh, from prison. Uh, <laughs> that guy that was they brought in to uh, basically take care of us and he didn't. He then basically liked us and he taught us how to smuggle uh, like uh, opium from uh, like police stations. And what you do is... <laughs> Hey, these are life experiences. You don't know when oh you might want to. <laughs> wow. You know, and how to smoke, how to smoke crack if you don't have a lighter or anything. It was very interesting stuff he taught us. This was supposed I to be a say, positive note. Yeah, well, on a positive sorry. note, I I'm do trying. Think that I'm trying. The um, I, I think look, there's going to be. I, I'm I'm I work in the arts, so um. You know, for me, I've always been very interested in, uh, I guess, probably because I grew up in Saudi. Um, I've always been interested in dogma and like just tackling dogma. I'm like, and it's, I feel like um, I'm starting to, you know, anyways, I, I'm starting to like, I've, I'm as here in Canada, it's been tough to kind of um, make sort of that cultural product a little bit, but um, I'm starting to kind of get up a bit here and there. Um, in, in New York and LA anyway, but that's beside the point. What I am trying to say is that I do think there are people like me out here who understand that things have gotten very anti-intellectual in our art space. And I think that's a big reason um, uh, because the humanities have really slipped in, in a way, yep. in my honest opinion. Um, and I, I look at popular entertainment in particular, that's very anti-philosophical, very, um, doesn't really tackle anything compared to when I was growing up where I felt like shows and songs, they tackled all kinds of things to a certain mm -hmm. extent, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that there's going to be a generation, hopefully, but I do think that there will be like some artists who will come out and, and because I think that's kind of really the only sort of, at least a starting point. If you make it, make it cool to be like, learn it again, if in, in a sense, you know, or at least be able to um, really want to know about something i really want to embrace the other people because i think the everything is in my opinion a lot of entertainment is very distant you know like when when you when you engage with it, it's very disposable it's not really designed for you to uh, learn about another new culture or that kind of thing it's just very like i'm in my world and i don't really care who's not in my world if you're part of my tribe cool but if you're not part of my tribe then you're the enemy that kind of nonsense, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it's, I think we're going to move in that direction eventually. It's going to have to move in that direction because people are bored already. So I think it's just the next thing. And there's also Wonderful. the next generation who always rebels against the previous generation's views. So basically, if you're this next few generations are going to be woke, their children are probably going to be not. They're going to oppose them. Dead. Yay. I'm trying to bring it up. What's wrong with you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what is okay, wrong yeah, with you? I hope it happens before then. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I guess. You requested it up ending. <laughs> yes. No, you know, I, I 
let's 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 stick with that idea you're right it will end hopefully soon it i think that october 7th has really pushed things forward um it's allowed a lot of people to see things a lot more clearly i think having those three university presidents unable to just clearly state that you know that you know that calling for the genocide of jewish people is against the rules in their schools um, I think yeah. that was all very shocking for people to recognize, like, what is happening in our universities? Um, and so, yeah, the problem know, is that's they're just is. waking up to it. And yeah. the other side has already been established, yeah. organized and training for decades. So you're a little See, behind yeah, doing it. Yeah. Hey, man, you started this. <laughs> but yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. It's true. But at least they can see it now. You know, yeah, so at least we're true. at the first step. They're waking up to and... what propaganda is, actually. Yeah, that's that's really good. They're understanding yeah. propaganda. They didn't until very yeah. recently. They really couldn't tell what propaganda is. That's right. From the yeah. Middle East, we are very familiar with propaganda. <laughs> you know, it's all we know. And oh, but yeah. here they're just like sitting ducks. Like you said, ignorance is bliss. They've just been sitting here, happy go lucky trusting their government, trusting their media, trusting everything. And now they're like, whoa, this is crazy. Everything's a lie. Yes, it's true. Yeah. You have to use your own brain. <laughs> Stop being so, um, yeah, trusting and soft and clueless. Well, okay. Siavish, I'm going to let you have the last word. Is there anything that you want to, to how do you want to end this? What's some advice you have to the world? um how can people find you um whatever whatever you want to end yeah. this with no well, i'm on twitter i i'm on x i guess uh but uh yeah if they want to follow me there I, i'm kind of i've been active recently on x a little bit but uh i'm not in toronto i'm not in any big city i'm on an island in the middle of nowhere with my animals but Honestly, I think people should, uh, one thing I recommend for a lot of people who are just waking up and trying to find fault in a lot of certain people is watch, <laughs> I can't recommend this enough, watch the Mouse Utopia experiment. Hmm. It's a yeah. very, it's 20 minutes on YouTube, you can find it. Mouse Utopia experiment. You'll see a lot of parallels and realize a lot of the problems you're basically the west especially is facing is as a result of the comfortable life that it has had it's just the result mm -hmm. of it it's like when you take away the survival instinct of a biological creature mouse utopia experience experiment they did that to mice who also live in super societies and you literally see parallels to western big cities every it's crazy it's crazy that's a very interesting thing to see and the other thing is when you wake up to something don't panic just find out how you can organize and actually do something to it don't just start shouting online it doesn't help anybody just support and find your groups find your people and see how you can actually make it impact on something organizing is a must you're late you're way behind <laughs> way behind <laughs> but you need to find people if you're serious you need to find people like you and go around find people like yourself and support them it could be a retweet it could be fundraising it could be just going to an event and just protesting whatever but yeah if you really care, you should do something. Online, just saying you are or sharing a meme, it's not really fighting. It's just making you feel good like those who virtue signal online, basically. Great. Sorry, Thank was you that so too much. downer? No, no, that's perfect. That's great. You're asking people to be active in their in their activism, basically, in their values and their beliefs, and you're absolutely correct. And I'm just going to do a little bit of a plug here for um, an organization that I co-founded called the Clarity Coalition, which is all about people from all different backgrounds, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, atheist, Hindu, doesn't matter. But if, they, if you are in the West, 
and you're concerned about Islamists, then this is the coalition for you. So um, look them up, claritycoalition.org. Thank, so yeah. yeah, uh, thank you so much, Siavish. I wanted to talk to you a little bit afterwards, if it's okay, if it's possible. We can... Uh, not on here, it won't. No, no, not on here. I'll connect with you. Yeah, for okay. sure. Yeah. All right. It was fun. Right. Sorry if I uh, lost my uh, composure for a second. I didn't expect like a debate form of thing and uh, I was out of my element. But uh, yeah, I don't respond well to being called a lawyer, but I should have maybe kept my composure better. All right. Well, thank you for that, Siavish. Um, I'm sure Sarah appreciates it. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Have a good one. Thanks. Thanks.